Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. It's 12.30 here in Virginia, and uh, I think some people are impatient. We've had 18 people um, in the room for at least 20 minutes, so um, let's go ahead and start. So, um, Shreya, please press record. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Maria Lisa Christie. I'm the Director of Women and Gender in International Development at uh, Virginia Tech's Center for International Research, Education and Development. Uh, Tria Sate is my graduate assistant. She's supporting this discussion series, and she's a graduate student in the School of Engineering here at Virginia Tech. So if you have any technical questions, I saw, Kimberly, there was an issue with the link. So I'm not sure which link. I guess you're watching the Zoom, but maybe our website um, somehow is not working. So Tria, if you could try to see what's going on with that. But anyway, please address technical questions to Shreya. And thank you, Shreya, for all your work before, during, and after the discussion series. So welcome to the Virtual Women and Gender in International Development Discussion Series at Virginia Tech. This is our first event of 2024, of this semester. And we're happy that you could all join us virtually for today's uh, discussion featuring Dr. Carla Macal as guest speaker. As of just a little while ago, we had 67 people registered uh, for today's event. So in addition to many diverse folks in the US, we have people who join us from other countries, including Guatemala, Australia, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. And besides students, faculty, and staff uh, from Virginia Tech, we have folks joining from lots of California universities, UCLA, UC Davis, UC Santa Barbara, and Cal State. So welcome to everybody. Please note that our event is recorded, so if and, and it will be available on our website later. So for all participants, by staying on now, you consent to be recorded. You can turn off your um, camera so that your image, if you don't want your image recorded, and still be able to watch the presentation. So uh, before introducing the speaker, I invite you to reflect on Virginia Tech's land and labor recognition. And uh, Shri is gonna put the link to that if you wanna see where that is on our on Virginia Tech page. So land acknowledgement. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of native nations from their lands in Western territories, including what is now California. We understand that honoring native peoples without explicit material commitment falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tulo Monacan peoples and other native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. Labor recognition. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude plantations owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also owned hundreds of enslaved people. We acknowledge that enslaved black people generated wealth that financed the predecessor institution to Virginia Tech, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on construction of its building. Not until 1953, however, was the first black student permitted to enroll. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosum that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. So now some brief housekeeping notes. This event will last approximately 45 minutes. Our speaker's presentation will be approximately 25 minutes, followed by about 20 minutes of discussion and uh, question and answers with the audience. All the participants will be muted to enable the speaker to present without interruption. As always, in order for our discussion to be as rich as it can be, we need everyone to be respectful and treat all participants with kindness and consideration and without discriminatory behavior. If anyone is disrespectful, including interrupting the speaker or bringing in off-topic issues, uh, they'll be removed from the Zoom meeting. 
We recognize that today's lecture is related to many interesting topics, but to respect the time of all participants, we'd like you to focus the questions on uh, the stated topics and our speaker's expertise. After our speaker's presentation, people joining on Zoom can raise their hands through the virtual buttons, and we will ask you to unmute yourself so you can speak directly to the speaker, or if you're shy and prefer uh, that I read your questions, you can put them into the chat at any time during the talk, and we keep track them, of them, and then I'll read them in the order that they were that they were um, uh, put in during the during the chat, and uh, we will we will read those at the end after the presentation. Uh, but please, with the you know hands raising your hands and uh, speaking, please wait your turn to speak so that we can avoid interruptions and maintain netiquette. Isn't that a funny word? Our netiquette. I think that's a very funny word. Please wait for your turn to speak so that we can avoid interruptions. Okay. Again, the webinar is being recorded and you will have access to it via our website. And that usually takes a couple of weeks because Shreya needs to do some work with a transcription. So now I know, um, Carla, you said we might have some people who are not English speakers joining. We could not figure out how to do an automatic translation through our site, but at least to enable the captions that might make it a little easier um, there's uh, information that Shri is putting on there, but um, I'm just going to read it. So in the, on the bottom of your screen, you can find option, you can select show captions, and you have to select English. You can't select Spanish because it won't translate. It's just that Carla is speaking in English, so you'll have to select what she's speaking in. So in advance, I'd like you to ask you to please answer the very brief survey that we'll share in the chat at the end of the event, and we'll also be emailed to you. And it's important. That's important for us to get your feedback about programming, and also helps us with fundraising. Okay, you can tweet us by tagging us at WGTBT. Sure, you can put that in the in the chat. Um, and now, finally, what you are actually here for? Um, I think we need to share the screen, share Carla's screen. But let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Carla Macal is a visiting assistant professor at the Gender and Women's Studies Department at Pomona College. I was fortunate to come across Dr. McCall last year at the annual meeting of the American Association of Geographers while she was still a PhD candidate at the University of Oregon, where I also did my undergrad and master's. Carla, I don't think I ever told you that. Um, so I have, I'm have i very uh, connected to U of O. But I found your presentation, Carla, very exciting. One of the best in the whole AAG. The whole session was so interesting. Young people with really very interesting new, new things that were happening in geography. So I'm really excited that uh, Carla accepted to join us at the discussion series. Now, a little bit about her research. Her research delves into the intersection of memory, trauma, and healing through her groundbreaking research on the marginalized native groups of Guatemala. As the daughter of a survivor, her personal connection drives her exploration into intergenerational trauma and its profound impact. She uncovers the intricate relationship between land, space, and history, resulting in her concept of cartographies of healing. Her research focuses on Guatemalan women survivors, both in their native land and in the diaspora, using a unique body mapping technique to capture their embodied experiences and memories. Today, she will share her findings and demonstrate the transformative power of body mapping in understanding and healing from trauma. Title of her talk, as you see there on your screen, is Healing Cartographies, Body Mapping by Guatemalan Women, Survivors of Genocide. Please welcome Dr. Macal. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Maria Lisa, for and the invitation um, and just so excited to be here with all of you. Um, so <clears throat> I'll be presenting part of my research to the Women and Gender and International Development Discussion Series. Thank you to everyone who helped organize the talk. And I also wanna thank everyone who made it out today, you know, to friends and colleagues. So to take you on this journey with me, I have this roadmap. <laughs> so I'm gonna be sharing about my positionality, the background of the study, a little bit of historical context, uh, the theoretical framework, some of my research questions. Um, we'll go in, in detail about body mapping and also I'll share my results and reflections. <clears throat> so I identify as a Guatemala woman in the diaspora. 
and I greet you from Tongva Territory, so-called Los Angeles. My research is a product of my personal and political story. What the Maya is a popular concept used by activists in the diaspora to critique the homogenization of Guatemalan people and center the Maya population. What the Maya is a capacious, fluid concept, and I carefully use it and resist state-imposed categorizations like Hispanic or Latina, Latinx that exclude indigenous populations. So I consider myself an interdisciplinary scholar, and every time I share a presentation, I invite my ancestors and my family with me. As you see here in this photo, it's a photo of my grandmother, Mama Manda, holding my mother and I. <laughs> so a little bit of the background of my study. Um, so my current work is a political project centering the oral and embodied testimonials or testimonies of Guatemala women survivors of genocide who are currently involved in collective projects to recover Guatemala's historical memory. While Guatemala feminist groups are connected across the United States, Mexico, and Canada, my study focuses on the relational testimonials of Guatemala feminist groups in Guatemala and Los Angeles. By centering the transnational oral and embodied testimonials of Guatemala feminist groups, and their production of counter cultural and embodied memory, it counters hegemonic narratives produced by the state. By doing so, this research bridges the work of South North Indigenous women. <clears throat> the relational testimonials transcend time and space, as the counter memories of the Guatemala feminist groups across the hemisphere are linked to spiritual practices of Maya cosmology. Maya cosmology unfolds life in a continuum creation of non-visible and visible energy forces. The groups also create altars in public spaces like you can see in this photo, art, poetry, and campaigns, building a collective voice to what I identify healing cartographies, weaving and mapping in the past and present testimonials of women survivors of genocide. So I, for my research, I went into this 2K study, so what the Maya feminist groups, but for this presentation, I will focus on the what the Maya group in Guatemala, and they are, um, they use the name Ocho Tijas, and they're a collective supporting the families, like you can see in this photo, of the 56 Guatemalan girls and survivors of March 8, 2017. And just to give you um, a br brief description of the case, on March 8, 2017, the tragic incident of the Virgen de la Asunción safe home fire killed 41 girls between the ages of 13 and 17. This was not an isolated event. It was a chronicle of a death foretold because the shortcomings of the system had been denounced several times before. As a community educator and scholar, I was not able to separate myself altogether from this terror from this case and the people involved in the search for justice. So I saw my role as a bridge to connect Ocho Tijas with other Guatemala feminist groups in the diaspora and spread awareness of the case. So in terms of historical context, uh, what also connects the group is where they're from, Guatemala. And I'm also, my family's also from there. Uh, from the participants' testimonials, it became clear that majority were victim survivors of the 36-year war from 1960 to 1996 war in Guatemala, forcing some of them to migrate to the U.S. and to other places during the late 1980s and still now. During the peak of the Cold War in the 1970s and 80s, the United States intervened politically and militarily in Central America to stop the spread of so-called communism. <clears throat> Governmental military forces, sorry, <laughs> primarily targeted the Maya people in Guatemala as they perceived them as an enemy and scapegoated them for working with leftist groups. 200,000 of the Maya people were killed, 45,000 people disappeared, and 1.5 million were displaced. So drawing from um, interviews with feminist groups, I argue that post-conflict gender-based violence or at the extreme level feminicide is a continuation of the ongoing state violence stemming from the war, from the 36 year war. I argue that while there's a body of work regarding cultural memory in Latin America and how it is produced through testimonies and visuals, less has been researched and written about how the human body as a site can connect to memory and heal from trauma. My research is attentive to the embodied experience of Guatemala and Maya women in the war concerning intergenerational trauma, memory, and healing. In Guatemala, 
Girls and women's bodies face multiple levels of violence from rape, domestic violence, poverty, and the onto the extreme scale of feminicide. Alarming statistics demonstrate that a woman is killed every 12 hours in Guatemala. And the, I really uh, appreciate this definition by Victoria Stanford as she writes, feminicide refers to the murder of women by men because they are women and points to the state responsibility for these murders, whether through commission of the actual killing, toleration of the perpetrator's acts of violence or omission of state responsibility to ensure the safety of its female citizens. So the latter part of this definition connects to the case of the 56 girls and how the state continues to omit responsibility. So to examine the connection between territory, bodies, and memory and healing, I am guided by the emancipatory framework of Cuerpo Territorio, coined by communitarian Maya Shinka feminist Lorena Cabnal. For Cabnal, embodied emotions are vital to evidence and verify what is felt in the body. So Cuerpo Territorio, or body territory, is a decolonial indigenous feminist concept that declares a body as our first territory and advocates for a communal subject agency. To assess and analyze my research questions, I use the following intersecting analytic foundation guided by Carnal. So she says, one, our bodies are systematically affected by oppression, such as extractive industries, domestic violence, poverty, sexism, and are also a product of two, body and territory are spaces of vital energy that must work in reciprocity collectively with other oppressed bodies. So to... Here are some of my research questions, but um, again, this is part of my dissertation research. So for this uh, presentation, I will focus on question number one. Um, I'm asking how are transformative memories specifically inscribed in the body, public space, and other symbolic and material geographies? So now I will share a little bit more about the research and the methods I use in order to respond to this question. Um, I did travel to uh, Guatemala in the summer of 2022 with a grant by the University of Oregon Center of Latino Studies. Um, and in this first, on this second workshop, this body mapping workshop, 20 family members participated, which was incredible because majority of them were mothers of the, of the girls. Um, they were visiting from different locations, such as Escuincla, Chimaltenango, Villanueva, Jutiapa, and Esquipulas. And these locations are not close. The, the location of the workshop was in the city of Guatemala, Zona Uno, and they travel about like two hours to an hour. So yeah, so we were able to help them with um, some transportation cost. Uh, what I thought it was amazing about this workshop is that children were present. So. Um, they were supervised by two psychologists, um, you can see in the photo, and while they were coloring and playing games, uh, the mothers were attentive to the workshop. Um, also, another aspect of this process is that it was very collaborative, meaning that Ocho Tijas, the, the group, you know, that continues to accompany the families, created the flyer. So they were in communication with the mothers. It took us about like three months to organize the workshop. Uh, but yeah, so that was something that I really um, enjoyed. So now onto the method of body mapping. Um, feminist geographers have centered the body as a site of struggle, resistance, but also healing. As we know, maps have been used as tools of colonization, of exercising power and violence. However, maps can also be tools of transformation and resistance. So aside from the verbal testimonies, I'm interested in the embodied um, testimonies and body mapping, here's a general definition, has been defined as a process of creating body maps using drawing, painting, or other art-based techniques to visually represent aspects of people's lives, their bodies, and the world they live in. So I, at Throughout my whole dissertation, I conducted two body mapping workshops, one here, one in Los Angeles and the other one in Guatemala. And I'll be speaking to the one about Guatemala, but both were like different uh, due to the themes that each body map covered. Um, so I'm very much inspired by the work of Elizabeth Sweet and Sara Ortiz Escalante, who also use body and community mapping with immigrant, immigrant women from Mexico. And they say maps, as storytelling tools reinforce the collectivity among those involved in their making. 
body and community mapping are tools that can be used as practices of transformation, self-consciousness, and decolonization. So in the following slides, I will share how the body mapping workshop became a sacred space by building trust, reciprocity, and connections with the mothers of some of the 56 girls. So a sacred space was created uh, by lighting a candle, burning some sage and copal to cleanse the space and energy, and doing some breathing exercises to initiate the workshop. Creating a space where suffering can be heard and shared is essential for the self to be reclaimed. As Chicana feminist Cristina Garcia Lopez says, for those who carry in their bodies, minds, and spirits the visceral pain of knowing that their own story is viewed as unworthy of description or attention, such narrative spaces can be sacred as listening and responding is central to the power of narrative. So I also borrowed uh, from Sweden Escalante, they recommend to use a uh, protocol of ethics and safety when conducting the body mapping workshops. So in this workshop, I reflect about these ethical elements and we created, um, for example, putting a spiritual altar in the middle of the circle, doing the breathing exercises and body movements, intentionally choosing a community-based location where the participants can feel safe, um, using popular education tools like providing questions and materials for the participants, and something really um, amazing is that we ate ceremonial food. So at the end of the workshop, we all had a beautiful lunch and we ate this dish known as pepian, which is a Maya dish in, in Guatemala. So now I'm gonna share a little bit about the individual body maps. Um, so I did ask, um, for example, in what place of your body do you remember your daughter or loved one? And what types of memory come to your body? So as you can see um, in this body map, the mother of Gayla Salguero, she drew a young girl who from the number in her t-shirt seems that she was 10 years old. Instead of drawing, instead of the mom drawing her own body, the mother chose to draw her daughter's body. And many of the body maps posters look like letters to their daughters. The mother wrote, justice for the 56 girls, in memory of Kayla Salguero, I love you, sending you a hug from a distance. And the next body map, um, this is from Ashley Hernandez's sister. Ashley Hernandez was one of the, the girls who, who, was, who was killed in this shelter. Um, in her head, she wrote, she wrote, I remember my sister, she needed to heal. We used to play with dolls. In her hand, I love nature. I feel at peace in nature. In her heart, my heart hurts for my sister. She needs to heal and let go. And in her leg, she says, I don't feel safe the streets in the streets because of the negative connotation. She used the word in Spanish, which is morbo. So it's a little bit like negative um, connotation being uh, carried, uh, women, women being a woman carries and how I dress. So something to also note is that these all these body maps were in Spanish. So I used, um, you know, like PowerPoint and other templates to translate the body maps for an Anglophone audience. Aside from their bo individual body maps, the group also created a collective body map representing the group. Um, so I asked the group to share words that represent them, and it was interesting to observe how the group also focused on how the state identifies them, and they wrote words the, on the body, like guilty mothers, prostitutes, and also how they feel about the state. And it was a total of 30 words. So I divided the words and themes into a table into three different categories, such as state narratives against the girls and where were they putting these words? And, and those words were like in the chest. Also um, collective emotions. Um, they were These words were on the stomach and pelvis area and also positive affirmations. And those ones were put on the legs. As you can see, um, state narratives such as like criminals, gang members, guilty mothers, uh, collective emotions, um, anger, guilt, and positive, let's support each other, love, dreams, education. However, um, something interesting to note about this collective body map is that it doesn't have any feet. So to me, it was interesting because feet to me symbolize journey, path, moving forward, but the mothers in the workshop demonstrated that they're just so exhausted, you know, they're not hearing any, they're not getting any justice from the state. So I thought that was um, really interesting.
So I also want to share my reflections and my analysis of these body maps. Um, just, you know, due to this presentation, there was a total of, of 20 body maps, but I'm just sharing some of them due to time. Uh, but if you're interesting, we can you can email me and we can chat. I'm, I'm thinking about putting them on a website later. Um, so my analysis comes from Marta Sturkin's Cultural Memory Contributions and Chicana Feminisms and Spiritual Activism of the Moon Goddess Scorio Shaji. So one example from Sturkin's is the AIDS Memorial Quilts, uh, which represent people's bodies, memory, and stories. The quilts are naming the dead and produce a body count, as Sturkin mentions. The image of Goyo Shalki today has been used by Chicana feminist scholars, first developed by Gloria Saldua, to speak about the ongoing and lifelong process of healing from traumatic events which fragment, dismember, or wound the self. The concept has been used in various contexts where healing is necessary, such as that of identity, cultural, educational, and even historical, making Goyo Shalki as important and relevant as it was centuries ago. Chicana spiritual activism with the moon goddess represents our fragmented selves, and I see it with the body maps of how the state, even after the girl's death, continues to inflict emotional violence towards the families. Koyoshalki medicine affirms our existence in time, and as broken as we are, we can go through a transformation and recreate ourselves. So I wanted to share a little bit about this concept of what is healing cartographies. So my research definitely took a very um, transnational uh, look um, across space and time. And indigenous women's um, continental activism conjured the scale of Abiyayala, a horizontal scale of connection to each other and to land that shifts the geopolitics of international diplomacy and transnational activism that had erased them and their epistemologies. So um, healing cartographies to me are exemplified by the verbal embodied testimonials of what the Maya feminist groups mapping out the plural communication and language through art, songs, poems, and events as a critical recovery of both memory and healing. I kept visualizing um, healing cartographies of my research, and I wanted to put it on to an image on a paper. So I asked my cousin uh, Marina, who's an artist, to help me <laughs> because she's an artist. So I gather uh, my fieldwork photos and asked her to add the photos onto an image of a woman's body, making the body of the woman a map. So the woman's body, as you can see, has no borders allowing for the territories to touch and embrace differences, but stretching out the territory for participatory change using spiritual technologies like altars. The red flowers around the collage are carnations, as, right. a, as red carnations represent the everlasting memory of loved ones. So what is powerful is to document our stories and celebrate the courage, strength, and cariño indigenous women continue to demonstrate amid state injustices. These examples demonstrate the tenacity of women survivors and their perseverance to gain justice and, rep and reparations in post-conflict Guatemala. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And here's my information. We can go on to a dialogue and questions. Great. Um, well, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and read. Um, I have two questions, but I'm going to skip mine first. I always mm -hmm. have questions, but uh, I, I let other people speak first. And only if there's like, <laughs> I can't stand it, or if there's just a silence, and I'll go ahead and ask my question. But so, Dominique Franco here at Virginia Tech says, Carla, thank you so much. Dominique, do you prefer to raise your hand? Do you prefer to speak yourself? Hi, sure, I can speak. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm in my office with the air on. Um, Thank you so much. Your presentation was amazing. I, it's so good to hear all of your work and sounds like a lot and it's essential, <laughs> like I said, important. Um, I'd love to email with you later, by the way. I went to Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. Extra excited to see the Claremont colleges represented. Um, oh, oh, nice. Yeah, um, small world. So I had a question about um, the manifestation in the body parts. I know mm -hmm. that there obviously are Western ideas of grief and chest and things like this, but um, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of like susto or even in bacho things that um, are Mesoamerican and kind of continue. Yeah. If there's any particularly Maya um, 
concepts of where kind of grief sits in the body or where it manifests physically that might be mm-hmm. either a carryover or continuation of um, Mesoamerican or mm-hmm. particularly Maya um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. ways of manifesting physically? Mm-hmm. That's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, I know I use Koyoshalki, which is like Aztec, <laughs> but I'm trying to move to my Maya, more Maya traditions. Um, so I think that's a good question. Obviously, like I, I taught a, a class at the at Claremont at Pomona about theories of the body. And as we know, like you mentioned, the body is a very, very like Western concept, you know, thinking about like Freudian, right, and all these theories. Um so in my research, I was really careful in not to go into like, um, how can I put it? Like, like to be like, like co-optation of like Maya spiritual practices. So I'm still very like careful because in Maya tradition, like you would need to be an akik, which is like a healer. And I'm, and I'm not in that position. Um, so yeah, I'm still working on that. And, and yeah, maybe like you mentioned, like where, um, grief where people hold grief and talking to like many of the women in the group obviously like our womb is also like a place you know that holds a lot of grief um and also like our throat you know so there's a lot of that because in Guatemala that's why it started with the war there's there's a lot of silences right like Lacey Abrego she talks about like like silences in our communities and so I think that it was it was beautiful to to um use body mapping because it's a technique where we can also kind of like voice and draw like our feelings instead of of using our voice sometimes because people are still scared of, of, until 2024 they're still afraid you know my my family there's they, it's really hard for us for them to continue talking about this so but yeah but thank you for your question and uh yeah we should definitely connect okay i'm gonna ask uh sharam to unmute themselves and then I wasn't sure Mel and I, t- I I texted you directly because I saw that you had your hand up first but um go ahead uh Sean please hi thank you so much that was really really interesting um I was actually wondering if like if any I don't know obviously this is very like difficult for all the women mm-hmm. but have any of them like told you that they would like continue to body map and that they would like that it was a very like healing experience for them and you know like hopefully that using art as an as a Mm -hmm. healing form um Mm -hmm. I don't know um if like the Mm -hmm. state isn't gonna do anything that they would do it themselves I guess Mm -hmm. yes thank you so much for that question so so I don't I don't share but I'm also a social worker (laughs) so I think Mm -hmm. that that this that discipline also helped me like build that trust right and like I always think about the self-determination of the of the centering the self-determination of the survivor so yes absolutely like they were just really happy like you know they've gone through so much and like after the workshop like they were smiling you know I don't um I'm writing I'm actually writing a paper about this and I do share that it was very cathartic because one of the women it for 30 minutes she just cried so we were just like like it like that's what I mentioned about the sacred space because she was just like crying and like screaming so we just let her you know like you know share her emotions um so post of the, the body map I did reach out to an elder and then she told me that she wanted to continue meeting with the women I am planning to go back to Guatemala maybe for the seventh anniversary of the girl's death so we are thinking of connecting uh, but even here in LA, you know, they want me to um, do a workshop with um, Gumayai women who are doing like a lot of like reproductive justice um, mm-hmm. work in, in Tijuana, like in San Diego, Tijuana at border area. So, yeah, so it is becoming very um, great, you know, to bring these methods because I see that body map is being used in Abya Yala in Latin America a lot and not so much here in the States. Um aside from Elizabeth Sweet, you know, the, the people that I mentioned. Uh, so yeah, so it is traveling up north. So it's also nice that we can do it here. Yeah. But thank you awesome. for your question. Yeah. Okay, Andres has their hand up. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
I have a quick question, just kind of, um, I know your focus is on the like body cartography and the um, mm -hmm. healing maps, but I guess I was just wondering if you got to think about or hear from the woman about different ways that they can be supported or um, other ways we can help them in healing other than just the body cartography to kind of like um, keep their story out there and, you know, to, to mm -hmm. let it be known in a sort of way. Yes. Thank you. So I'm going to put it on the chat. So that if you are interested in following on, on Instagram, it's called Nos Duelen 56. But there was a camp, like an, a global campaign in 2018 with different artists, but they were focusing more on the girls, on the 56 girls. Um, and I know one of the members of the group of Ocho Tihash, they want to do a, a book about the girls like stories, because a lot of times, like I mentioned, like the state continues to see them as criminals, right? Like criminalizing them. Um, so we do want to put like, what did they like? You know, what were they like their stories out there? So that has helped the mothers. But yeah, the mothers do need a lot, a lot of support. I know some of us here have sent even like money, right? Like for them to like, you know, like go have go to the different events or the vigils or for them because they if you, I don't know, if you go to Guatemala on, on the main, like the plaza um, where the, yeah, the main space, um, there's a uh, altar for the girls and it's called Plaza de las Niñas. So I'm also writing about this altar. And so that has helped. So not just like you mentioned the body maps, but also a physical, beautiful altar with 41 crosses. Um, and it's there, like anyone can go visit. So, so the, their memory is not forgotten you know so yeah so that also has been helping thank, thank you, you. Mm -hmm. catalina would you like to yourself? hi yes um i'm going to turn my camera too hi <laughs> Hello. Uh, nice meeting you and uh, this was a, a very beautiful uh moving uh exciting presentation i'm happy to have the opportunity to meet you um, and I am also very interested in mapping and embodiment as way of black feminist knowing. So I was very excited to see that you, how you were using it the specificity in your work. Uh, and I was also more curious about the methodologically how you engage with mapping, you know, as the practice mm -hmm. of mapping. Um, you know, you mentioned the limitations of uh, you know the Western kind of colonial approach to mapping versus other ways of um, engaging with territory and space and embodiment that maybe go beyond the demarcation of like specific limits that are kind of constrained with this idea. So I'm interested about, um, I've heard a little bit about Cuerpo Territorio, but I haven't had the mm. opportunity to study it yet. Uh, mm. But I, I am just interested about how you uh, approach that in this, like the tension between like the physical representation of demarcated boundaries and how mm -hmm. um, maybe that was, yeah, I'm curious about that kind of tension of, of mapping and how you engage with that. and. Um, also, their understanding of the body in itself and just kind of what is possible to represent and maybe if there is any embodied practices that were supporting the engagement with analytic part and, or the memory part of um, mm -hmm. examining how something manifests in the body and whether you can demarcate it or like if you not, do not demarcate it, how does it kind of exist and how it's possible to um, document um in an embodiment or in in, ter in the territory and in memory so there are so, so a lot of the questions that have to do with being excited about the map of the cartography mm -hmm. other questions about representation and um mm -hmm. the limitation that sometimes goes with that so thank you yeah, definitely i think um in terms of the limitation like i shared a lot of the mothers didn't they didn't draw their own bodies so that's also interesting to me right how they focus on their their daughters or something else you know aside uh, away from themselves um but in terms of like like you mentioned the tension of mapping um so I did come to geography later in my career so um I uh, I know you know a lot of disciplines are very like colonial and I think they're also said in a very like mind over body approach um so in terms of my work I really wanted to center like emotions and you know emotions are very connected to our bodies so there's a section in my dissertation where I do write kind of like 
this like literature review on like how disciplines are so and feminist geographers talk about this you know and since the 1990s uh, I could if you want I could send you some articles so because I was so focused on the emotions I think that's why I was drawn to like this approach of body mapping and I think body mapping is so beautiful because there's different approaches like I've seen people like do huge body maps and also use post-its and like you can do like your draw your emotions right and but in my particular area I was interested in in place right the places that that hold you know like fear or negativity onto our bodies and memory so yeah so there's different approaches but definitely you can email me and we can continue the conversation thank yes you. I will definitely reach out thank you so much yes okay um okay go ahead Christine and then, and then <laughs> go ahead. oh it's Nick it's not Christine <laughs> Yeah, this is actually Nick. Yeah, thank you. What a beautiful talk. I'm uh, so moving and it connects to many things. Yes. I also, I do work with Guatemalan communities um, in defense of territory. Mm -hmm. And so, and I've heard about the reimagination of territory happening at multiple scales. And I'm really interested, and I know you mentioned it earlier, but I would like to ask you to talk a little bit more maybe about how does this relate to a broader reimagining of territory in relationship to different kinds of, of development or extractivism mm -hmm. uh, where these conversations are intersecting at different at different places? I know the sector de mujeres was involved in a lot of dialogue around these questions. Um, mm -hmm. so I want to, yeah, I just want to think about, have you talked more about the reimagining of territory in general as wow. well? Yeah, that's a really good question, um, especially in terms of like transformative memory. Um, so something that I'm working on, and I can share a little bit more on the workshop here in Los Angeles with Guatemala um, people in the diaspora, a lot of them were focusing on like borders. So as you can see, like the body of the woman, right, like the map, it didn't, it, it was interesting to me because subconsciously even my cousin like we didn't put any borders right on the on the map so I think that's one way of like reimagining you know like our territories I as you can imagine many like indigenous communities like they don't think in terms of like property or borders or or borders so I think that's where um, my work is probably I'm just finishing an article with um, Catalyst and publishing on on these um, the idea of like weaving memory throughout the hemisphere across settler colonial borders thank you thank you very much I look forward to reading more of your work this yeah. <laughs> you're welcome thank you so, Carla, actually, my first question is very related to what Nick said, although it's more theoretical. And that is, this is a geographer, I'm a geographer, so this is a very geography kind of angle. <laughs> and hopefully you'll speak in a way that makes sense to every normal human. So how do people engage in healing transnationally? You refer to people healing transnationally. So what are the challenges as a researcher of jumping from the scale of the body to national to transnational scales? So your first question is how are how are they engaging in healing transnationally? Yeah, but yes, but more how are you conceptualizing that as a researcher because you're jumping from the from embodiment, but literally from the scale of the body and embodied mm -hmm. emotions and experience, mm -hmm. jumping to literally national and then transnationally with a diaspora. So yes, yes. Did you um, your dissertation? Like did you did you figure out a way to you know, talk about scale in that way? Uh, yeah, I, a little bit. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think in terms of scale, you know, we could also see like power dynamics, you know, in, in the groups. And and I think um, one way what's happening, you know, in Guatemala and a lot of Central American countries is the forced migration. So I don't, sh I, I did share in my dissertation, I don't share it in the presentations, but um, two, um, actually three of the members of Ocho Tijas ha were forced to migrate due to the repression, the political repression in Guatemala against the group because they 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 know a lot, right? Like they, you know, security. Um, so unfortunately, in, in terms of like transnational healing, like I know they couldn't be present in the body mapping workshop, but a lot of them have also asked for me to do like virtual like virtual like body maps. And I think that's one way, you know, to answer your question about how do we engage transnationally? Like 
I would love to write a paper on digital feminism, like digital like ways of, of doing or using these tools and just being in conversation with one another because a lot of um the people that did migrate, like they're 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 depressed, you know, like who do they talk to? They feel alone. Um so yeah, so there's I'm thinking about those, yeah. Thank you for your question. Okay, so my other one is actually your question. You listed your dissertation questions, and the the second one, um, you said you weren't gonna have time to talk to, about, but you actually do. And I'm just curious. It's a broad question of body mapping as a tool of transformation. Okay, so yeah, I think um, I think body mapping. You know, it you know it has to like what I've learned you know doing these workshops is not it's not just like a one hour thing it has to do like like five hours it was it became like a retreat and also having like this dynamic of different elements not just like in like the, the doing your body map but also like to having a spiritual altar and like really guided by what the the people believe right like their their spirituality and also like building community so I think that's where the transformation is going you know not just seeing it as a, a researcher or a tool a research method sorry but more of this like encompassing like different elements if that makes sense. So it'll be great if I can create a curriculum and people can join me <laughs> in doing this, but that's the way, how I see it as a transformative method. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else have a hand up? I don't think that we've missed any questions in the chat, but we still have almost 15 minutes. So please uh, join in the conversation, don't be shy. Thank you. Oh, I had more time. I, I know. I <laughs> we have, uh, yeah, we have a lot of people on here that I'd love to hear from. So I'm not going to. And Jess, go ahead. Andres. Um, this is a little off topic, but it's just something I'd like to understand a little bit more of, because I know you briefly covered it at the start. Um, I had, I'm not sure if the two are, are similar or they relate in any sort of way. But I remember in um, high school, I was talking to my parents, um, specifically my dad, who's my Guatemalan side of the family, and he told me about the genocide in Guatemala. Um, the civil genocide is kind of how he described it. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, um, is this like, is that, but that was like, he described it a really long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. Is that connected to this current situation in this sort of way? That's a good question. Well, that's my argument, right? That it's it's a continuation, like the like feminicide and gender based violence, or what what happened to the fifty six girls. It's a continuation of this war. Like although Guatemala, I don't know if you know, but there was peace accords in December of nineteen ninety six. Um, those it it didn't provide so much like peace to the to the community, right? Um. And it was it wasn't so long ago, right? Like it was until 1996. So it was a 36 year war. Like and and I'm and I'm sharing this because as like you, like I didn't know. Like I had to do my own research in this dissertation in order for me to learn about this war. And even now, like I get very emotional because I can't believe. You know, we see what's happening in Palestine, right? Like the, we are, we are living through ongoing genocides right now, and. And it, it continues to happen, right? And and, I, and it's against like subjects, like it was against the Maya population. People were forced, like my grand, my great grandfather was disappeared. So yeah, so it wasn't so long ago, but just to answer your question, um, yeah, I, I feel like it continues. So yeah. Thank you. Great. So Christine slash Nick. <laughs> yes, we're doing, we're doubling up. Um, and uh, I just have um, maybe kind of a, a methods question a little bit, or just a curiosity, um, Carla, and also just thank you for this incredible talk. This was <laughs> so fantastic. Um, I was kind of curious about um, like what kinds of questions participants might have asked. I'm thinking about like, did, did, did they perceive any kind of limitation um, to the exercise? So did they say things like, oh, can we do this? You know, can we write words or um, could I build something? Or, you know, like, did they try to do anything else um, that wasn't available, you know, sort of tools wise or just um, 
yeah, I guess I was just curious about whether they wanted to change or add to the exercise at all. And if you if you had thoughts or just could tell us a little bit about that, because it's just sounds like such an interesting um, mm -hmm. way to be with research participants or, you know, yeah. just research participants. But yeah, I was just wondering about what they wanted to do. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, yeah, a lot of them didn't know the way, the way they were coming, right? Um, but it was just so amazing that it was like 20, 20 relatives. Um, um, but yeah, some of them, I, I, I wish I can show you all the body maps. Uh, but the ones I show, you know, like the first one seemed more like a letter, like, like these letters, like it was like whatever they couldn't express to their daughter, right? Like if, if it seemed like they were expressing it in this type of method, um, again, not drawing their own bodies, uh, other folks like the younger generation. So it was very intergenerational as well. Um, the younger did draw their whole complete body from head to toes, while the older generation like didn't. So that's also interesting to me in terms of like generational, like the way we see our own bodies, right? Like how the maybe the younger generations, they they're okay, you know, with with their bodies and the older they feel a little <laughs> embarrassed. Now. But uh, but yeah, so that was interesting to me how they changed this method of more of like the body to letters yes that that's that was interesting mm -hmm. thank you thank oh, you for your question thank you okay clock people here tom we have two toms two the head of geography and the head of sea rat are both toms and, both <laughs> and, and uh, lots of other people there's also a question on the chat if you'd like me to respond. Yeah, let me read it. Yeah, I don't I don't see it. Yeah, yeah I put it in the It says, can you talk more about your identity as a watermelon born in the US settler colony? How does this play out in dynamics with relatives in Guatemala and such? Yes, I must oh cool. I'm a Salvadoran born in the US and send you a hug. Thank you, Edward. Um, I don't know if Edward is still here. Um, oh yes, we're here. Um, yes, okay, <laughs> we can talk. Um, so yeah, so like I mentioned, like some of us are identifying more with the Guatemala concept. Um, you know, like being here, I learned that I do have like Maya ancestry, right? Like my great grandma, great great grandmother is from Comitán Chiapas. Um, and she migrated on, on a mule to Guatemala in 1920s. Um, so yeah, so I was, I migrated. My mom brought me here when I was four. So I'm like the 1.5 generation as they know, they call us. Um, so yeah, it's the dynamic is interesting because a lot of my family who's in Guatemala, they think I'm kind of crazy that I'm spending so much time <laughs> wanting to learn about my history and like, like they don't they they're like why like why do you want to know they keep asking me that um yeah so um so yeah I think to me it's just a reclamation like kind of like how the what the Maya and I am part of one of the groups so it's also this part of recovering our own memory um and not what the state says because up until like I want to say like 10 years ago 2011 I believe uh Guatemala denied that genocide you know, until they they went, they took the Ishil women to court and they testify. Um, they finally said, "Oh yeah, there was a genocide, right?" Like they would call it a civil war, right? But it is it it was a genocide. Um, so yeah, so thank you. And the same in El Salvador, right? Like there the diaspora here. We are, there are I have um friends who could who also do the same the the same work, right? Um, but it is difficult and the dynamics can be, yeah, a little, there can be some tension. So thank you. Okay, I don't know. Welcome. If I'm missing any hands or text messages. Well. Um, Carla, is there anything else that you want to say that has been raised by some of these concerns or things that you didn't think you could fit into your time? Um, I think I'm going to put my my website and my email address on the chat if anyone wants to email me or to connect, because I know there was like about two people that wanted to connect, if that's okay. Let me see. All right. You can, this is my personal... Um, 
No, but I'm always so happy to share about this. You know, it, it is my story. It's my dissertation, my research. But um, but yeah, I'm always like so <laughs> excited to share. Sorry if I do get emotional, but um, I think it's part of the process, the healing process as well. So thank you, Maria, for inviting me. And I continue continue to, we you know, hopefully we continue to collaborate. Oh, I think, let's see. Uh, let's say you take the hand and Dominique hand is up did you not take it down before oh no she's clapping she's <laughs> clapping yeah <laughs> thank okay. you okay let me just say a few final words so thank you so much carla and thank you all for attending and participating um this was a wonderful presentation as i knew it would be and i'm very excited about your work and yes i also will be watching um what you do so <laughs> we're, sh <laughs> we're sharing a short survey in the chat so perhaps uh, she has put it in there please please respond to it. Um, and our next event is going to be a very special Women's Month event, and it will be hybrid. So if you're on campus, you can come to the multi-purpose room, and if not, you can join on Zoom. But Dr. Niti Ariel Kanal is an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology and Gender Studies at Tribuvan University in Nepal. And she will be here, and she'll be talking about the intersectionalities of vulnerabilities multiple marginalized experiences of women and girls with disabilities in Nepal. Please don't miss this one. And check out our website for other events and let us know in the survey if you want to be added to our listserv so you get reminders um, about our events. And so that is all I have to say other than have a wonderful day and we hope to see some of you on March 14th and I'll follow up with you, Carla. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Take care. Bye.